Hey, Mitch. What are you doing in here? I'll show myself out. So we are out here at BJB headquarters with Troy of BJB fame. And of course, we're in uh, BJB HQ in beautiful Tustin, California. And I have a mold for you, Troy. That, okay. And I have a, a, a particular question, a technical question that uh, I wanted to, to get your thoughts on this. So this is an ancient mold that I have that I actually took this off this little fertility idol that may or may not have been in something that we all know. Who knows? Um, but this, this particular idol, one of my customers, good night, this would have been um, probably over 20 years ago, uh, brought me a resin positive and let me make this mold off of it. But this mold, now being over 20 years old, mm -hmm. is about to be done. So I'd like to be able to cast at least a couple of these guys out of this mold before it fails and uh, have one that I could paint up and do a nice gold paint mm -hmm. job and maybe another one that we could use as a pattern. And I'm curious, the main questions I've got for you is, first of all, we're going to have to use, obviously, mold release to get it out of this. And I want a nice paintable part. So two questions. Would you recommend a solid pour or how would you recommend attacking this? Yeah, yeah. In, in this situation, it happens a lot. Sometimes you get a legacy mold and you're like, I need to redo this. But the mold itself is on its last leg and you've got uh, one or two shots maybe. And you, you do risk of maybe one more pull will rip that mold and it's done. So you better get it right in the first time. So we want to minimize that if possible. So yeah, to answer the question, obviously this is a solid part, and whenever you pour a big solid part, you've got potentially a lot of exotherm. Even if you use a low exothermic material like our 1630, which is filled. Um, but something like this, I don't think you need to go to that. You could look at, um, now you told me this was out of 808 actually, right? Or yes. Similar. Okay. TC 808 yeah. Jet Black. Yes. So okay, so along those lines of questions, or along that line of uh, logic, so you've got this mold. Um, it's, uh, it doesn't look too bad, but one, one thing that happens is if there has been a variety of other materials also cast in here, sometimes a different material might lock onto that. So it finds something in, within that silicone material, plasticizers or whatever that is, and it wants, it'll actually lock it on. And you think, well, that doesn't make any sense. It's a silicone mold. But over the years of casting material, it kind of slowly deposits its own uh, fingerprint, if you will, of whatever that casting material was on a mold. So we have to be cognizant of that. You do know what you cast in here, so that's a good thing. But sometimes you don't. Sometimes people come in and go, hey, I need you to do this. This is a mold from 15 years ago, and we don't know what was made in that. So you want to approach that. That's where the mold release comes in. So yeah, so a couple things. So number one, obviously, this is a uh, you know not a two-piece mold. It's one-piece sock, right? Yes. So very limited on how you can get in there. So what you want to think about is obviously get a spray release in there, something paintable like rocket release. And we use rocket release because it uh, doesn't have any silicone oil in it. And if you're going to come back, add primer, paint it, or whatever you want to do to, to fix it up or add Bondo, you use a silicone-based spray, it's going to be really challenging to get that anything to stick to it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would look at this as number one, definitely a spray release like rocket release. Um, it goes on, doesn't really impart any sort of a texture. But I would, just for insurance purposes, um, I would actually probably put talc powder in there as well. Okay. And we can get away with that for two reasons. Yes, it, it does put a texture, but if we know we're going to primer it and fix it up, we know there's going to be some tweaking and tuning because the mold's probably got chunks out of it and, you know, little imperfections. That, that talc powder was probably a good insurance policy because it does almost add like a layer of... Um, protection. It's almost like it's almost like PVA when you do wax and PVA uh, without having to go to that extreme. So that's kind of how I approach it. And then the other question about whether I think you do like a solid cast or maybe even like a slush cast. Again, we want to think about exotherm and heat. Um, so I'd probably slush cast this or rotocast it if you can. Okay. Um, and you could get a good layer in there and then and you could maybe backfill that with something or even like a foam but I probably wouldn't do foam expansion um, you, so you could do that approach but like I just wouldn't pour a big giant solid slug in there I'd be afraid <laughs> it would build a lot of heat and then it might stick in somewhere and if you didn't get a great casting that time then you know now you've got a lot of body work to do well okay so now you just you just 
explain some things to me that I had a situation, in fact, it was about 20 years ago, around the time that I did this mold, where uh, it was actually a 10 cure silicone mold that I was using, and I'd been running parts with one resin, and I thought, I'll try this other resin formula in mm -hmm. to make a stronger part or whatever, and immediately seized up, and it was like glued itself to the mold. And I always wondered why that happened. Now I know, yep. because that was something, if you're watching this video, you've probably encountered that, uh, and I did not realize that that sort of thing can can happen where you get the stuff absorbing into the silicone. Mm -hmm. and um, But anyway, yes, good to know because I've had a, a couple of molds that just all of a sudden it was like night and day. Suddenly it went, they were working and then they suddenly weren't. And now I realize, yeah, when you're switching the resins around, the yeah. the, the strange things happen. So Yeah, and, it, and that can happen between obviously uh, different manufacturer materials. So one manufacturer, you were casting a, a, a type of resin and then you want to try something new and say, I want to try this for, you know, I want to tint it. I want a, a clear or, or, you know, clear base so I can tint it or things like that. That happens a lot. You know, you want to try different things. Or maybe a, I was casting it out of a flexible material and now I want to go to a rigid material. Even, again, even uh, polyurethane resin systems within the same manufacturer, like especially with our, you know, even with our systems, you may go from one type of a system that could be like an MBI base, and then you might go to something else that could be more of like a, you know, a TDI base or something, something along those lines to get into the uh, scientist <laughs> area, the chemistry. But um, uh, that happens, you know, and, and and the molds get seasoned, and so there are there are deposits. That's why you see old molds change colors and things, and, and they kind of dry out. But sometimes they they even absorb a little bit of color from the urethane you're casting, and so that's. On a molecular level, there's something happening there, and it's um, hard for us to predict that all the time, so always use caution. So in light of that, so let's say, so which release would you recommend, knowing that we want to pull at least one of these out of this and put a gold paint job on it with minimal sadness of the paint coming off, what yeah. would you recommend? Because I would really like to make another nice gold one. Yeah, and at the end of the day, I would use a non-silicone oil-based release. Now, I, I bring that up and I reemphasize it because silicone oil is the best release. If you've got a part that pops out and that part is done, let's say we pigmented it a red or a black and you don't have to paint it, you don't have to glue it to anything, the part is done and it just has to exist in the world. Silicone-based mold release, pretty much all day, every day. Uh, silicone is great because it acts as like a mold conditioner for your mold. You'll get the most, likely, the most pulls out of that mold. So everything's a, everything's a trade-off. So you always want to, like, you know, you emphasize a lot in your videos, start with the end goal. What is this piece going to, what do we need to do with this? And what, what do we need to get out of this piece? Well, I need to paint this, or I might need to bondo or, or do some little f uh, fixing up. So, again, we would look at more of a non-silicone-based release. And it, you could even potentially even use, like, a, 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 a you know, even a wax-based spray release or something like that. But, again, I just like the rocket release because it warm warm water and a little dish soap and it pretty much goes away. Beautiful. Well, so in the, uh, so E236, that's silicon oil, right? It is, so yeah. that's the one we would want, that's the kryptonite. And then as for the, the one we'd use for this would be the E302? Correct, that? yep. Okay, E302 so E302, rocket. spray that in and then dust it with the baby powder or the talc? The talc is really just a nice insurance policy. It kind of adds a little bit of like a microscopic layer or barrier. But really, for what we're going to be doing, it adds a great paintable texture right out of the mold. Because sometimes you have a part, and this like this this is you know could have some shiny spots, and it could come out shiny. Well, if you're going to apply primer or paint, you're going to have to dull that anyway. You're going to have to get a little Scotch Brite or a little wet a little wet sand, a little 220 or you know, okay. 400 grit. You're going to have to knock that shine down anyway. So if you need to paint it, you need to do some adjustments. If the part itself maybe. Maybe on a part, again, this, it could be this part, it could be a different part, needs shiny here, but this, this, this one's more textured or more matte finish. Again, you've got a variety of things going on. Um, then it just kind of starts with a, a baseline of a paintable surface, and then you can kind of level up from there. Now, when we powder the mold, when we use the 302, powder the mold, are we, do we then still need to rinse this with the warm soapy water or... or uh, yeah, I would still okay. definitely uh, okay. yeah wash it off because there could be obviously some some talc left on there. Okay. Um, yeah, but I mean it's a it's a really nice way to just approach that something like that. And um, yeah, I just I always tell people like when you've got even um, old molds or even like a new mold or you, there's some question there, 
I always like, again, I go back to like my days of composites where when you had a brand new mold, typically you would wax it. And, you know, if you did enough coats of wax, you could probably lay up a part in there and get it out. But sometimes that mold is new and it's still, it's got reactive sites on it is what they call it. And so the new resin that goes up against that finds something to attach to. And sometimes wax isn't always perfect. And so that's why people spray PVA. PVA is an actual barrier and it's kind of a, uh, it's just, I always tell it, it's a, an insurance policy. And so I, I, it's kind of the strategy that I look at something like this when there's some questions and we don't know everything there is about this situation or this mold or what it's going to do. If we just <laughs> spritz a little rocket release in there and, and, and cast it, it could, there's a possibility it could stick. Something could stick in there. So We're yeah. going to find that out. Yeah. And either way, we at least have one, uh, uh, one good pattern out of it that uh, could be remolded. Um, if that's if yeah. that has to happen, but uh, okay, well let's get cracking. Yeah, let's now, see what we can do. Overall, the casting was fairly simple and straightforward, but here's the important details of how we made sure that we protected this mold and made sure there wasn't too much exotherm in the casting process. So first of all, this is Troy uh, spraying the inside of the mold with the E302 mold release. And again, E302 is a non-silicone oil mold release. And as Troy mentioned earlier, that's a really important detail because that means we don't have silicone oil transferring to that resin part, which is almost impossible to remove. It just takes a lot of work to remove silicone oil from a cast part. Now, as soon as the inside of the mold is coated with mold release, now Troy is going to put in the talc powder. And what he's doing here is just closing up the end of the mold with his hand and just jostling that uh, talc around inside to make sure it evenly coats the inside of the mold. And we're gonna do that a couple of times here just to make sure absolutely every part of the mold is coated. Again, this is just insurance against the uh, resin sticking to the inside. So we wanna make sure that the inside of that silicone mold is well coated with that 302 release. And then of course the talc powder as well. And now we're using some compressed air to blow out the inside of the mold and just get out any of that excess talc uh, before we cast. So again, mold release first, then talc, and now ready for casting. Now to minimize the exotherm on the resin cast, we did a rotational cast by hand using TC808. And TC808 of course is mixed one-to-one -one by weight, but we did this in three different layers. So here's Troy's mixing up the first layer of TC-808. And as many of you know from my previous videos, the 808 is available in white that we're using here, but also jet black. And that's actually what I used for that idle cast that was in the intro to this video. Now we can pour this up solid, but that will generate more exotherm or more heat. So as Troy suggested, we're going to be doing a, a hand rotational cast with three layers of the TC-808. And each layer is very thin. These are small batches of the TC-808. And each one we're going to slosh around on the inside. And that also ensures that we get a nice bubble-free surface on our part. Because that's one of the downsides on a mold like this that does have some kind of weird undercut areas. Filling it up solid um, is tricky because you can wind up with some little voids in some of those areas like the chin and uh, the, some of the little legs and arm areas. Now, TC-808 is a fairly fast setting resin, so we have about a two minute working time and about an hour demold when we're working in uh, thin sections like this. So here, Troy's just taking care to carefully slosh that around, make sure it coats the inside of the mold all over. And this is where it's also handy to keep your mixing cup nearby so that we can pour the excess into a mixing cup and make sure that we get the base of that little idle really well. Because that's one of the tricky things when you're hand rotational casting and you don't have a mold that closes completely. You want to take care to make sure that you do get the base of the piece coated really well. So that's what Troy's doing here is just having that cup handy so we can pour it all the way back out and make sure that we get that resin down there at the base of the piece. Now because this does have a fast set, um, it doesn't take long for this to start to gel and then we're ready to mix up batch number two. So here this uh, first layer has started to gel and now ready to mix up the second layer. And by the time that's mixed up, we're ready to slosh that around and coat the inside of the mold and do it all over again. 
Now on a part like this, it's important that we take care to slosh this around in such a way that we make absolute sure that the uh, base of this little statue is completely coated. So that's where it's really handy to have that mixing cup standing by so we can pour it back out and make sure the base is really well coated. Because again, that's gonna be the hardest part to hand rotationally cast and get it nice and thick. So make sure that the base is getting well coated and that's where, again, it really helps to have that mixing cup standing by so we can make sure that we get that uh, completely covered down there at the bottom of the statue. And really this last layer of resin, this was just extra insurance against exactly that, making sure there were no thin spots, especially down there at the base of the piece. Now an important little detail here about fast setting resin and doing this kind of process by hand, it's important to remember that that first layer of resin that we sloshed around, that was into a room temperature mold. So we were able to get the full two minute working time out of that. But when we do these successive layers, this second and third layer that we're sloshing around, because that first layer and the second layer are kicking off exotherming and creating additional heat, that will speed up those last two layers of resin. Now this is about an hour, hour and a half or so later, and you wanna wait a decent amount of time, at least an hour, hour and a half or so, or longer if necessary, if you have a really thin part, and use that flange around the bottom to check and make sure that the uh, resin is at a good enough strength that it can be demolded without warping or deforming the part. And TC-808 is a really hard, really strong casting resin. And because of its hardness, it also works really well for uh, cold cast metal applications. So uh, I think I've done some videos in the past with that, but uh, it shines up really nice when you add metal powders to it. So here I just broke off a little piece of resin off the base just to test and make sure that was ready to demold. And now we're just gonna roll that mold right off of it like a sock. And now we have our little resin idol ready for finishing. Now, as Troy mentioned earlier, because it does have a little bit of that talc and release residue, we want to wash this off with soapy water, just warm soapy water before we start painting on this. So uh, in a follow-up video, I will be uh, finishing this with a nice gold paint job. So in that video, I'll be covering the process of cleaning this and priming and painting this. So stay tuned for that. And as always, make sure if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. And on the end screen, I'll put some additional resources for resin casting. So check the video description for product links and the end screen here for links to both the hand rotational casting process with the Chuck E. Cheese head, as well as machine rotational cast with the Halo helmet.